in the months of November, December, January, February, we'd have about seven or eight events a day. Hmm. You need one guy going for each event because you have to also set up the drum kit for the yeah. If people don't know how to do it, you're sure that people don't <laughs> steal symbols. And we've had instances where <laughs> high and expensive symbols have disappeared and cheap pieces of metal have replaced them and come back, you know. <laughs> Namaste and welcome to Music Mehfil India. Our guest today is Anthony Gomes of the extremely well-known Fatado's Music, the largest retailer of music instruments in India, among other things. This conversation covers the 158-year-old legacy of this music business and everything that has evolved in that time in our industry, especially the last three decades. Because from Davids to Goliaths, from the loners to the tribes, these are the stories of music in India. Do you play an instrument? Yeah, I play the violin and derivatives of the violin, the viola. Yeah. When did you begin? So here's the first funny episode. Yeah. We are four kids mm -hmm. and for our sixth birthday, my mom and dad, and I'm the eldest, mm -hmm. uh, instead of gifting us what all our friends at that time were getting, cars or toys or something, we got piano lessons. So I actually enrolled first with a very dear family friend to learn the piano. Mm -hmm. But after six months, I didn't quite enjoy it too much. Mm -hmm. So I asked my dad and we, I moved to the violin. So two of us play violin and viola, and the other two are pianists. We're four kids, yeah. So, but at that time, at the age of six, we thought our parents were absolutely crazy giving us piano <laughs> lessons as a birthday <laughs> gift. In hindsight, we're very grateful, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. And um, do you still play? Yeah, so I learned for quite a long time. I mm -hmm. must confess I was not a good student. <laughs> My first teacher, a very accomplished violin teacher, mm -hmm. used to bemoan the fact that I, he started his day with me and he had several similar students for the rest of the day. <laughs> but uh, uh, I loved the ins I loved the instrument. Mm -hmm. I still play to sell violins in the store. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we also employ good violin violinists as store staff, so I get less of an opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. But um, periodically, but not very often now, I used to, on a regular basis earlier, I play in the Bombay Chamber Orchestra. Oh. So I'm hoping to return to playing with it very soon. Exactly. And uh, that has given me the greatest joy of music making because ensemble playing is unrivaled. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoy it. So to that extent, I do play still, yes. How, how often does the BCO practice? The BCO rehearses every Sunday, uh -huh. except for major holiday periods. And uh, approximately two weeks or maybe a week, depending on the nature of the program, Prior to the concert, it rehearses every morning from mm. 7 to half past 8 in the morning. In fact, that's the reason I quit the orchestra, because I keep late nights. Yeah. And in order to make it early for rehearsals, I used to hardly sleep. Mm. This was the time when my dad was still alive, mm. pre-2003. I had been playing the orchestra for several years. And uh, my colleagues at work came and petitioned my dad and me jointly mm -hmm. to beg me to give up playing in the orchestra. <laughs> Because I'd get up so early in the morning, <laughs> hardly sleep, mm -hmm. and then come to work there after, after the re rehearsal and shout and yell at everybody. <laughs> so it was very traumatic for them. So I did, I did give up at the time, but I really would love to go back to it because I really enjoyed playing. Okay. And it's, it's a good orchestra. It's performing very nice program. They performed just last Saturday. Mm. Very nice concert. And uh, uh, I, I, many young, young musicians, classical musicians in Mumbai, Mm -hmm. I've been brought up, trained, developed their love for music because of playing in the BCO. Mm. All right. Let's talk about Fatados. Yeah. Uh, um, so you said you have three siblings? Yeah, okay. we're total okay. four. Christopher, uh -huh. my second brother, and my sister, Nonna Bill, mm -hmm. and my youngest brother, Joseph. We're all in the business. It was started in 1865 by one Bernard Xavier Fotado mm -hmm. and one Luis Manuel Fotado, two brothers. Okay. Uh, and my dad bought the businesses uh, in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. In 1953, he bought BX Furtado and Sons, which is one of the two uh, very well-known showrooms in South Mumbai, mm -hmm. Adobe Talao. 
uh, at that time that store was bankrupt and had gone into receivership because the previous mm. owner had regrettably you know lost money on it mm-hmm. and my dad was 27 and he bid for it in a public auction and got the i mean bought the shop he didn't have the money to pay for it uh, <laughs> so he told us he did mm. two things one is he took out a life insurance policy mm-hmm. on himself and made the people from whom he borrowed beneficiaries should he in a, at any point of time not be able to pay them back and two is he borrowed from the local goans of dobi talao at that mm. time dobi talao was a hub for the goan population because they used to stop there en route to uh, mm. the ships they used yeah. to sail and the many clubs even today in dobi talao area and actually he took most of his loans from the goan tailors I'm happy to say he paid them all off three or four months later because mm-hmm. he was a very astute and successful businessman. But And we found out about all of this really only when the life insurance policies matured several years later when we were old enough to know about it, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So uh, he bought he bought BX Furtado in 1953, but mm-hmm. that's not the music business. That mm-hmm. was Christian religious goods and he expanded into printing and sporting goods, etc. The music business originally was LM Furtado and Company. Okay. And there's a nice story to tell of that. Uh, the f- it re- That shop had remained in the family, mm-hmm. the Furtado family, for several generations. And the then owner was migrating to Canada mm-hmm. and was looking to sell it. And you... surely have heard of a very respectable music business in mumbai competitors of ours but also good friends bargava's music yes so mr govind bargava the uh, patriarch and highly regarded and respected owner of the at the time of bargava's music uh-huh. was approached by the former owner of lm furtado to buy him out mm-hmm. and i am told that the deal had all had been concluded uh-huh. mr govind bargava himself first told me this story when i went to meet him because my dad sent me off to him to be mentored and to learn a little bit about the music industry from him when i was very young when i just joined my dad's business mm-hmm. then after my dad told me more about the whole story when i probed about what mr bargava had told me so apparently lm fotaro and company had a small department of christian religious goods as well historically yeah. music and religion went hand in hand It still yeah. does but not so much really And of course Mr Bargava being non-Christian sought to close down that department. Mm. So he was very happy to buy the business from the then owners a gentleman called Mr Selvin. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh he made only one proviso to lay off the two employees who were employed in the Christian religious goods department and to close down that department. Oh. So obviously those two employees were concerned about their job. Mm-hmm. So one afternoon they went to my dad the stores are around the corner from each other yeah. he was having lunch told him why don't you buy the business music will nicely complement your christian religious goods business my dad told tells us several years later that he turned around opened his safe mm-hmm. picked up his checkbook walked around sat in front of mr selvin who he knew quite well and had a chat with him uh-huh. offered him 5000 rupees more than what mr bargava had offered paid him the 5000 rupees by check within 30 minutes and sealed the biggest deal of his life today fotaros has no christian religious goods anymore because sadly we are not very competitive in that area the business has reduced and all mm-hmm. our main stays actually musical instruments and sheet music business <laughs> which is what my dad acquired in lm fotaro and company so quite a story yeah yeah so we that was in 1959 so yeah. from 1959 both companies are now uh, owned by the gomes family in fact The owner of BX Fotado and Sons, Bernard Xavier Fotado, uh-huh. was the first principal of St. Xavier School, the famous St. Xavier School at Fort. Right. You know, he was a maths teacher. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure why he made the move to business. <laughs> but uh, so that was his. But the music business, hmm. LM Fotado and Company, opened, set, started by his brother, Luis Manuel, right. was uh, music, was <laughs> musical instruments. And then since 1959 mm. uh, to all the way till today yeah. what have been uh, some of the milestones like how has the business grown so pre 1990 business was very difficult in our country yeah P- period i mean across yeah. the board primarily because there were major restrictions on account of the socialist Uh, approach of the government of the time right uh, very very high income tax marginal mm-hmm. rate of income tax was 97% uh, 
you know, <laughs> and so very not conducive to doing, mm. uh, you know, good business. And uh, imports were completely embargoed. So mm. we had no instruments, no instruments period that we could import. Mm. We were surviving on a hundred plus years old pianos. and We had uh -huh. a large collection of them, which we used to rent out to students for 50 rupees, 100 rupees at the time mm. per month. Sadly, doing a disservice to some of them because mm. they were in not very good condition. Mm -hmm. So many of them, so we had an inadequate number of staff to repair and maintain them. Right. I'm pretty sure some kids gave up playing the piano because the piano was not good enough. Mm. But that was the basic environment in which my dad struggled to survive. Mm. That's why he uh, diversified. Mm. We had a very, very successful printing business. Right. You know, yeah. I, I'm told second only to the uh, Times of India printing press in terms of uh, respectability and amount of work. It did the work for a lot of mm -hmm. schools and institutions and all. And I think dad primarily made his money in those years on printing, which he then... Um, diverted to supporting the development of Western music mm. and music in our city and in our country by keeping the businesses afloat. So the only thing that was permitted in terms of imports was sheet music, printed music yeah. books. In a time pre-internet -in and pre-digital, mm -hmm. uh, the printed book was crucially important for music education. Yeah. I dare say it's because of his efforts and his sacrifices mm. that he was able to ensure that there was an uninterrupted continuity to music education in our country, throughout right. the country, because we were the only music shop that continued to do print music, because it's a, a difficult business to do. Yeah, You can buy music, but if nobody wants to buy it, then whatever you try to do to sell it, you can, you're just left with it. And we have a mm. lot of sheet music that is really nice stuff, but has yeah. not appealed over the years, and so we still hold it in stock. Mm. It needs a lot of ability to absorb lost margins on account of unsold stock, which he was able to do. Lovely. Uh, and then what happened after the, the 1990? Great, the great divide was 1990, Manmohan yeah. Singh's liberation budget, Correct. throwing open the uh, Indian market to foreign investment, etc. Mm -hmm. Enabled us to start importing and buying. To our good fortune, we kids were just in our early 20s. I, I was still in college, in fact. Mm. And so dad gave us the liberty to, uh, you know, dream and go so i remember going for my first trade fair to frankfurt mm. uh, not knowing what to do and uh, after visiting several big suppliers there immediately barely two months later with a visit from the then international sales manager of gibson who went with me around the country visiting shops and all those that was the time when there was no email so yeah he, i remember him sending a 35, 40 page fax one morning entering the office and there were reams of paper lying on the floor, full proposal mm. and a target of two and a half million dollars in 1993 for us to do of uh, Gibson guitars. And I took it to my dad, cut up the paper pages, stapled it, showed it to him and said, see what this guy has written. I don't know how we're going to do two and a half million. He said, this is the problem that arises when I allow you guys to do things all on your own. And mm. then he renegotiated it to $25,000 a year. So from two and a half million, he was able to bring it down to that amount. It, just uh, for us uh, youngsters, uh, what is that equivalent to in today's currency? Two and a half million today would be approximately 20 plus crores. See, this is the problem that we are faced with with our principals overseas. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that we do not have a, an infrastructure in music education in our country. Yeah. Going back to when we got our independence, mm -hmm. especially where, you know, education was well serviced, like in Mumbai, in the main cities, there was a thriving uh, music culture. Mm. Bands played, people it, learned musical yeah. instruments. It was it it was a given that you learn music in schools. Yeah. Over the next decade or so, as India tried to. Uh, rid itself, if mm. I may use the word, of the yoke of colonialism yeah. and wanted to purge from its system, mm. education system, yeah. any Western British influence, mm. Western music and the teaching of music was eliminated from the scene. Mm. So there was no government funding, there was no school funding and gradually music just disappeared. Mm. So when I grew up in the uh, late 70s and 80s, 
for us, a music class was a music teacher sitting on the piano playing songs and we sang it. Yeah. But 25 years or 30 years before that, you learned music, you learned musical instruments, you had school orchestras, you had school bands, yeah. which happens abroad. You yeah. know. And so for a very long period, in fact, till now, yeah. that culture has not yet revived. Yeah. Efforts are on now. We, in a small way, are also trying to do the same, yeah. uh, trying to revive that and ensure that music education comes back into schools. A lot of international right. schools are showing the way, yeah. bringing in good curriculum, in um, employing teachers mm. at uh, viable salaries, etc. Yeah. It's in, uh, times are interesting and promising, but mm. uh, because of this huge shazam for yeah. this such a long period of time. Yeah. Sadly, the awareness, the patronage, the interest, the hunger to learn a musical instrument yeah. as opposed to listen to music, which is yeah. very different. Mm -hmm. You know, we are a very musical people. Yeah, yeah. It's in our blood. We sing well. Our, mus our culture is so ingrained in music, mm -hmm. our movies, yeah. uh, our entertainment, everything. But the learning of a musical instrument, you know, mm -hmm. was considerably discounted, perhaps even eliminated for decades. Mm. And that's why the market does not exist commensurate to our population. So yeah. foreign uh, principles of ours will say, at that time, 1.2 billion, 1.1 billion population, you should be buying millions of dollars worth. Mm. But you have to analyze what's the potential of the market in terms of infrastructure, music teachers, music schools. Correct. We have only one full-time professional orchestra. Mm. The Bombay Chamber Orchestra is yeah. a solitary full-time amateur orchestra in the country. Yeah. You know, you talk, go to any other country where there is a decent uh, um, uh, infrastructure for music and you'll have yeah. so many amateur orchestras, several professional orchestras, people, you know, competing for employment in a professional space. Here yeah. there's not even a desire to because there's no future. The mm. infrastructure is not there. The funding is not there. The support for the arts is not there. Because this generation has not been brought up with that in mind. Correct. You know, so when a big comp corporate wants to spend money on something, it'll do it on something where the people who are in the decision-making positions mm -hmm. have been exposed to and have been uh, and appreciate the values of some other things. I have mm -hmm. no idea what they do, but mm -hmm. not music, unfortunately. Yeah. So that is why the disconnect is there, sadly, today. Mm. Uh, Fatados delves in a lot of things across the board. Could you... Uh, enumerate a little on that in the music space yes. well uh, of course the s selling the import and distribution of a lot of musical instruments mm -hmm. many many brands uh, sheet music yeah uh, we have retail shops as well we have 17 around the country mm -hmm. and um, we do a lot of backline rental mm -hmm. supporting events uh, professional events as well as amateur events school events some of it on a commercial basis but the vast majority on a you know uh, gratis basis it's mm -hmm. primarily to support the activities that are going on we have a music education vertical Futaru School of Music, yeah. which is uh, teaching music now in mainstream schools, trying to re redefine that landscape that I was just referring to, where music is not being taught in schools. Correct. They're present now in almost 200 schools wow. and growing significantly. The pandemic, of course, to some extent, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, slowed down this process. Yeah, so, and then... Um, we also represent Trinity College London for ex assessments mm -hmm. in Western India and particularly in Mumbai and Goa, uh -huh. where we organize these exams for music and for communication skills, drama, English language. Mumbai, in fact, pre-pandemic was the single largest center for Trinity in the world yeah. outside of the UK. So mm. I think that's about it. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, Tell tell me more about FSM. When did it begin? And what were you trying to achieve? What are you it's trying to achieve? It's a good question because it needs a little bit of perspective. Uh -huh. So we agonized for many years over whether to start a music what, music education vertical or not. Yeah. Uh, we realized the need for it. But our greatest asset, Futaru's greatest asset, is our music teachers. Mm -hmm. Not those employed by Futaru School of Music, but the ones who send their students to us to buy music, etc. Mm -hmm. Great relationship. We've gone out of our way to encourage them to grow their teaching practices with a, refer a gratis referral system. So we re recommend many students to them to learn and all of that. Mm -hmm. A relationship that has been built over decades 
And we were worried that if we started our own school of music mm-hmm. associated with Furtado's, teachers would feel a bit uh, intimidated and concerned about the fact that mm. we may try to poach their students from them when they send yeah. them to us to buy a piano, to buy books or whatever. Not that that would never ever be our intention, but that would be a concern. Mm. And we didn't want in some way to compromise or, uh, you know, vitiate the relationship that we have with them. So we agonized over this decision for quite a long time. But then the need grew very great. Mm. And along came two very, very capable ladies. Mm. One, my brother's wife, Tanuja Gomes, and her colleague, Dharani Upadhyay, both high-flying private bankers, mm-hmm. who I think were fed up of what they were doing with money mm. uh, but and wanted to do something that really made a difference. And so they took up the gauntlet, offered to do this for us and conceptualized and launched Furtado School of Music in 2011. Mm. And when we started, it was a center model. Basically, you set up centers and people come to you. Okay. But it was because of their uh, uh, open-mindedness, initiative, innovation, etc., which I suspect, at least I personally, would not have been able to do. Uh, they diversified and they changed the model completely mm. to the one that we have today, which is going out into building music education and providing teaching in mainstream schools so that the reach and the influence is much broader, wider, deeper, more effective than mm. the few hundred or a couple of thousand who would have come to our institution and right. into our standalone center. So now we're touching almost 100,000 students influencing wow. their education in music. The target is much bigger. The hopes are very ambitious and FSM is on a very good footing. But they're completely driven by the same objective, to spread music. We, we're actually, f- we have a very exciting uh, opportunity, which okay. very few countries have, you know, where mm. there's a need for something and an opportunity for us to do something. And not yeah. just us, there are many others doing it, thankfully. Yeah. And so it's changing the landscape for the next generation. Because this is mm. not a quick fix. Correct. can't happen overnight. You can't yeah. learn a musical. In-, in fact, what FSM does also is not, it provides literacy. It doesn't yeah. provide uh, expertise. Yeah. And then those who do learn about music and have decent literacy, understanding of it, certainly technical and all, can then opt to pursue it further and then they come to our centers, go to other teachers, other schools, etc. Okay. So that's the objective really of the whole thing and something that they're doing in a very, very effective and successful way. Incredible, incredible. Uh, so FSM sends uh, their teachers to schools. Do you have any qualifiers for what kind of schools um, you choose? Or or they choose us, basically. Yeah, or they choose you. <laughs> so yeah. it's, of course, a business model. Uh-huh. So we want as many uh, schools as possible. We want as many clients, customers, partners as possible. Mm-hmm. So we go to a lot. We participate in education fairs. We try to create awareness among school Mm. owners, trustees, principals on the Mm. value of what we can offer. Mm -hmm. They're all very worldly wise. They know what is available and all. But many now, now much fewer, but when we started, didn't know what was available to offer their students in our country. Mm. Now they know that we have a very good uh, brand name and uh, awareness and demand for our services the breadth of the country, you know, length and breadth of the country. So that way, especially uh, post-pandemic, you know, I'm not personally directly involved in the running of FSM, Mm -hmm. but I am involved in the board and all of that. Mm -hmm. We are being told of instances where people are now calling us rather than we going to them. There's a demand, you know, a pull for our services, which is very, it's really heartwarming. It's also exciting because, you know, we get to do it. So we have 350 teachers who work for us, fully impaneled, full-time teachers, you know. And we have a very, very well-thought-out, intensive teacher training program Uh available also to those who don't want to. I mean, we provide them placements, we provide them employment, but there's Mm -hmm. no compulsion, you know. And because the greatest need is to create good resources, you know, and standardized resources. So the the Futaro School of Music uh, delivery in, in, you know, somewhere in, rural Maharashtra should uh-huh. be on par with what is being offered in, say, Bangalore, for instance. That, that sort of standardization is only possible with training. Yeah, so. that was my next question, that 
these many teachers they are only in the metropolitan cities no, no. across the country the challenge of course is that so i'm often asked because mm-hmm. of my uh, you know personally me because of my trinity contacts and uh-huh. you know the network that futaros has around the country access to teachers access to musicians please help us i think recently i can't remember the place i'd never heard of it before mm-hmm. somewhere in the interiors of karnataka fantastic mm-hmm. very good school wanting to do it but we needed teachers who are available to go there every day yeah. we needed teachers local to that area or teachers ready to move there yeah i believe they were able to fulfill that requirement yeah so mm. it's always a challenge you know but we're trying to provide careers we're trying to provide a good future for the pe- teachers who empanel with us and work with us mm. i think we succeed in many re- in many respects yeah uh you mentioned the pandemic uh your business is heavily imports uh dependent yes so how did you cope with the pandemic it was a very very tough time we coped yeah but it was not easy yeah so I mean, not only us, but the entire country. Yeah. For six months, mm-hmm. was not permitted to do any business at all, including mm. e-commerce. So, different from India abroad, mm. you know, all businesses were shut, but e-commerce was permitted across the board. Right. But in India, even only e-commerce of essentials, of uh, you know. uh medicines and other pharmaceutical based right. uh, business and all was permitted even our warehouses were closed so we a- actually did absolutely no business for 6 months and it's not a, i mean we are a mid sized firm we have mm-hmm. over 200 employees in futados alone mm. not talking about futado school of music but in the music import and distribution and retail business that's yeah. a fairly large number we didn't mm. lay off a single employee we didn't follow a single employee we paid them salaries every month mm. albeit small reductions here or there yeah. you know so something that we that's the culture we have in our organization uh, and all something that we didn't even give a second thought to doing but mm. really cost us very heavily in terms of reserves in terms of you know stability we had good leadership we have mm. a very good uh, chief executive and management uh, when the company is no longer family run oh. yeah, it is family owned uh-huh. we have professional management we have a full professional structure in place and they helped see us through this yeah so now the recovery process is on and going quite well i'm pleased to say business is rebounding ha- has it already have uh, rebounded to where it was pre pandemic yes yes thankfully yeah uh, we are now looking for the how much higher objectives that we had earlier that were all you know sadly okay. interrupted hmm so um as someone um who offers a diverse range of products and services and you've been doing this for quite some time how have how have your customers evolved and second part of the question how are they different in the metropolitan cities versus uh, the rest of the country i think the greatest evolution wherever you was tier 1 or tier 2 or tier 3 cities has been customer awareness and knowledge to uh-huh. the internet provider it's not a an unusual situation if your customer walks in or contacts you if it's digitally and knows much more about what he's do, buying and the products that are available than you yourself do mm. you see so one big evolution is that of customer awareness which is good yeah helps us you know stay on our toes we don't always do a good job of it to be honest <laughs> i think uh, our greatest uh, uh, asset has been the relationships we forged with customers mm. so that has helped us uh, you know uh, contend with some of the major uh, changes that have happened over the years primarily that of digital e-commerce you know it's mm. not an area that we can do very well in primarily because we don't play the uh, you know huge discounting game very well mm. it's difficult if you yeah. have a long term objective this sort of a model is not sustainable you know right. so we do do our best we give our best pricing we do quite well but we will yeah. never be you know doing fantastically because we can't sell below our cost we yeah. can't uh, work on gross merchandise value as the only determinant etc etc mm. you know it's here where relationships come into play because people want somebody they can trust yeah. they want products that they know are reliable you know mm. and they know that they we're always going to be there we have well before anybody else even 
you know, in our industry, which, as mm. I said, is probably only 30 years old now, from 1990, yeah. really, when things started developing. Yeah. When anybody even talked about warranties and all, we were giving lifetime warranties, long-term warranties, service. We have a very large after-sales department all around the country, wherever we're mm-hmm. located and all. So a very strong emphasis on service, after-sales service. That has stood us in very good stead, continues to stand us in very good stead, because that's our differentiator, basically, mm. our value system. You know, and we did, when we started corporatizing in the late 2000, you know, 2006, 7, 8, mm-hmm. we did a research on how the Futaro's brand was, uh, you know, valued in in the market. And the three attributes that were associated with mm-hmm. us was reliability, trust, and honesty. So, you know, mm. that was something that we took great pride in then and something that we've always tried to continue with over the years. And I think that's what's helped us. But mm. the demo, but the uh, market is changing, the customers are changing, their expectations are high, yeah, and they want what they can get overseas, which is difficult for us to offer here mm-hmm. on a consistent basis because the market is still not big enough, so the variety is not possible. Yeah, it takes a long time to ship from overseas to here if things are not available. That all is always a challenge. Yeah, all boils down to the level of service you can provide. Hmm. Customers are very willing to wait if you can, if they can understand why they have to wait. So. Right. So, I mean, today a lot of the music is uh, made on computers. Has that affected uh, sale of instruments? Not really, because at least in our country, mm-hmm. the market is growing. So, yeah. even if you want to make music on computers, you have to first learn music. Correct. You know, so you learn music either on the guitar or the keyboard or the piano or the, whatever it is, Indian music. Mm-hmm. Your initial formative years is on an instrument. Mm-hmm. Then you go into music production and creation and all of that. Yeah. Then you avail of technology as you deem fit. Mm-hmm. So as long as there is, as long as we can continue to interest young people mm-hmm. in learning this wonderful uh hobby or life skill Mm -hmm. of playing a musical instrument, whatever it may be, or singing, Mm -hmm. you know, but music. There will always be demand for music education and musical instruments. It's definitely in our country because we have so much to make up over Mm. the many years that it hasn't happened. Uh, But, uh, you know, I mean, uh, tech and all that is finally what people interest themselves in their homes. Mm -hmm. Some of it professionally but the vast majority of people just play for pleasure yeah you know and they are going to always need musical instruments mm. can't have people playing ensemble music you're a musician yeah. you're jamming together imagine each of you sitting in your own homes <laughs> you know communicating through a computer yeah. maybe one day that will actually be possible not going to be enjoyable mm. you know. no we certainly got a taste of that in the pandemic i know to yeah. the extent that you never <laughs> want to do it again ever yeah. again I'm fully aware of that. In fact, the pandemic to that extent has done a great disservice to digital Mm. in our industry because it was a normal progression that should have come about, including teaching online, Mm. which is really a wonderful way to be able to reach education to people who can't get it immediately. But there's such an aversion for it now because we had to put up with it for two years with tech that just could not cope with it and stress on both the receiver and the provider. (laughs) At the present juncture, people just want to think otherwise, you know. So, whereas otherwise it would have been a normal progression and over some period of time, we would have genuinely had a lot of digital Mm. and online teaching happening. Yeah. There still is, yeah. but not to the extent that there could have been because there's a there's fatigue, mm-hmm. you know, online fatigue. And have you dabbled in uh, any tech uh, services yourself pro- from Potato Potato School yeah. of Music is cutting edge. Unbelievable. Within four months of the pandemic, mm-hmm. overnight, at that time, I think they had about 130, 140 schools. Mm-hmm. Overnight down to no schools at all because schools were not working. Mm-hmm. And they just moved straight onto a digital platform. So they have a complete digital offering. Yeah. FSMBuddy.com is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Online teaching, but also a full LMS, a full mm-hmm. teacher training program, all online because they have teachers now all around the country and they can't keep on bringing them in here. The teaching in school classrooms now is hybrid. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. It's both uh, in person, but before we needed a ratio of one is to seven. Now we can have one is to twenty. Yeah. Because teachers are joining online. There's a lot of content that has been created. Huge mm. digital content. You know, I mean, uh, all proprietary, all by the team at Furtado School of Music. So that has all been deployed very effectively. And they're, it's a hybrid system. They're using a lot of tech in the traditional teaching as well. And mm. I'm very pleased to say it's really paying dividends in terms of quality, in terms of upholding standards, in terms of training trainers, mm -hmm. all of that. So we do a lot of that, yeah, including, you know, uh, we have a, what, uh, an app called Practice Buddy. Yeah. A kid goes for a lesson goes to school, learns a particular piece, he or she has access to the music at home on an app, mm -hmm. activated only because you've learned it. Hmm. Put the app, put your device on your music stand or piano or whatever, yeah. practice your piece. You made a mistake, it immediately gives you an assessment, tells you where you made the mistake, right. reports to the teacher the entire practice for the whole week. So gone are the days when I was a student when I could flip to my teacher how much I had practiced. Because now everything is, you know, being catalogued <laughs> yeah. and shared, you know, not only to the teacher, but to the parents. So yeah. a lot of, a lot of tech. Yeah. Sadly, the tech piece in education has been terribly sullied because of the huge amount of money that came into it yeah. being burnt up and lost. Huh. Not in music education, also in music education, but not with respect to Fadaru School of Music. Uh -huh. And so it's sometimes nowadays being, uh, you know, observed with a jaundiced eye, mm -hmm. sadly. Yeah. But actually it's, you know, game changing. Really, teachers are empowered, they're excited about it, they're involved in, you know, creating content. Yeah. It's, a, it's, very, it's very empowering. So, outside of the top metros, which are the tier two or tier three cities that you're seeing coming up fast in terms of music education, um, even instrument sales, um, or just general interest in music? Oh, I mean, it would be difficult to identify a city or two. Uh, YouTube has made a big difference in terms of education. Yeah. So there is knowledge, there is expertise. Mm -hmm. You hear of fantastic musicians coming in from, you know, tier two and tier three cities, all self-taught. You know, mm. self-taught meaning through uh, yeah. digital mediums and all of that, not with a teacher and all. Not so much on the classical front, more on yeah. the popular front, contemporary music and all of that. More the pop stuff, maybe Bollywood and all. No problem. Mm. Fantastic. I mean, I would find it very difficult to single out a particular few places and all because it's widespread across the country. Mm. Absolutely no limitations wherever you go. Wherever there is internet. <laughs> yeah, precisely. That's nice. the opportunity. That's yeah. also the limitation because we don't have enough resources to go there. We're not mm. a huge business with limitless funding. Mm. That's the opportunity. So where do you see uh, Fatadu's go in the upcoming decades? So the School of Music, of course, is going to continue mm -hmm. doing this music empowerment, music literacy mm -hmm. uh, mantra that they have, you know. I think that's going to really, if we continue the way we're doing it, where we don't compromise on standards, mm -hmm. but we are scaling, scaling yeah. in, uh, in an ambitious and, uh, uh, you know, calculated way, mm -hmm. I think we could really make a difference in terms of music literacy including serving as, you know, an example to other entrepreneurs to get into this space. Because mm. there are, I mean, 600,000 K-12 private schools in the country, let alone the thousands, hundreds of thousands of government schools. Mm -hmm. And there's demand for this all around. There's so enough space for everybody to get involved. And we hope that will happen because absolutely no arguments against music education. There's nothing you can say that can convince a school or a, ownership of a school, not to teach music in the school, it can never be called bad, it can never be called uh, unproductive, you know. It's just that there has to be a desire to want to offer it and resources available to teach it. So, um, Futaro School of Music definitely will continue on that path. Mm -hmm. And Futaro's ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, we started on a plan to expand with more and more uh, outlets. Mm -hmm. We will probably not have as many outlets now as was our original plan, primarily because of e-commerce 
and the possibility now of reaching everybody through various digital means uh-huh. but certainly expansion especially in higher end products so th- that's how the online marketplace um, uh, online marketplace is coming up has changed your plans a little correct no but that's yeah. always i mean uh, business planning is always evolving hmm. and we can't stick to a plan i mean if you don't have a plan it's bad but yeah. you can't stick to your plan it has to change as often as we have to be agile hmm. you have to be as uh, responsive to the changing times we have to try and influence the changes as well hmm. to some extent we've done that in the past now we don't have so much control over ai and all of that we're <laughs> not in that sort of a position to do so but definitely the way we will sell will be determined by all these new tools available but we will continue to expand in terms of our presence especially for high end uh, instruments especially for pianos uh-huh. uh, people need to experience and play them especially the uh, you know cutting edge uh, 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 products that come out of companies like Steinway the Steinway Spirio mm. it's a fantastic uh, you know instrument that is you know that technology has taken to another level altogether people need to experience these in good venues and good locations mm. so there will be expansion on that front uh, uh expansion on uh, you know uh, having a presence in certain places where we are not there so since you mentioned international brands uh your uh, product mix is largely dominated by international brands yes yes where do you see do you see indian instrument manufacturers come in the mix we hope they will so pre 1990 mm-hmm. they ruled the roost you know we only made do with indian made instruments yeah sadly not a very good quality because there was no competition yeah sadly when we brought in the foreign products not just for arrows but other importers as well hmm. they fell by the wayside because they weren't able to up their game which hmm. is sadly um, a reflection on maybe the re- investment environment or whatever but yeah. they weren't able to do so so at this current juncture there is some uh, I mean Yamaha for instance have set up this huge manufacturing facility in Chennai. Oh. Big investment, but it's Yamaha, it's not mm-hmm. an Indian brand. Mm-hmm. But it is Make in India, which is a very nice initiative they've done. Mm-hmm. Generating a lot of instruments from there, uh, entry level guitars and keyboards. So I hope that will be a, a you know a provide impetus for development of the manufacturing industry. But mm-hmm. basically we have not been a manufacturing industry, you know. Yeah. We have some good manufacturing of violins and all, but at a lower level mm. you know because there's a big violin market carnatic hindustani music yeah a lot of need for instruments so there's huge manufacturing happening in central india and rampur and those places in up yeah wow i would have never imagined rampur yeah. neither would have i <laughs> <laughs> okay so um speaking of uh, supporting uh, uh, the local music scene uh, what have your efforts been in this direction I don't think they've been calculated or planned it's just happened over time. Mm-hmm. You know, when we started introducing these brands um everybody was keen to try them out. Mm. But quite typically of the 1990s most kids didn't have the support of their parents. Yeah. For music and music education, you know. Mm. Some respect we became their sort of foster parents, you know. Mm. We allowed them this experience. so our store at metro in fact hmm. from 12 to 3 in the afternoon nobody could take lunch each guy was attending to a, each sales staff of the end at least three or four uh-huh. customers but primarily everybody was jamming on floor <laughs> so there'd be there'd be three drum kits in different corner there'll be hmm. guitarists and bands from St Xavier's college all the schools in south mumbai everywhere guys would just come and play And also because jam rooms didn't exist back correct. then that's right and so, even today the jam rooms that exist don't make it so easy uh-huh. you know f- because you have to book and there are you know there are limited number of yeah. so we've always kept our doors open hmm. but i think emanating out of that experience it then started this big college festival boom mm-hmm. of the late 90s and early yeah. so that's actually when our backline business started mm. quite involuntarily and simply unplanned mm. 
because suddenly we had all the colleges around the country wanting good quality amplifiers and drum kits and all so that they can have these festivals and band competitions yeah even today we are associated with so many of them mudai particularly yeah. but also several others you know in mumbai especially but even elsewhere and so we realized that we needed a large inventory to mm. service all of this so we created this huge backline i don't know how many hundreds of drum kits and amplifiers and pianos mm. we have 14 high end pianos to make available for all of these things yeah in order to put them to good use a lot of that was being used had to be provided free of cost in order to keep them u- in use and the opportunities to make money out of that were few and far between in those days mm. because commercial acts yeah. and all weren't really coming into the country it's not so much nowadays of course it helps to keep it afloat mm. we do have considerable business backline business which right. makes it possible to ke- still have a huge warehouse and a lot of inventory available for mm. a lot of uh, sponsored or gratis or highly discounted you know maybe sometimes we'll only charge you for transport you mm-hmm. know to provide all this gear and i think that has been one way we've been able to support uh, it's been a challenge because especially during post pandemic and even otherwise because mm. the costs are very high yeah you know you to I mean in the months of November December January February we'd have about 7 or 8 events a day. Hmm. You need one guy going for each event because you have to also set up the drum kit for the Yeah. If people don't know how to do it you're sure that people don't <laughs> steal cymbals and we've had instances where <laughs> high end expensive cymbals have disappeared and cheap pieces of metal have replaced them and come back <laughs> you know that sort of thing. So you have to do all of this and it's all a cost including mm. transportation. So kept on uh, uh, regurgitating the uh, you know decision on whether to continue doing this or not but i think that will never stop at least not in the fotado's ethos which has been to be as supportive as possible without any you know calculation or whatever it has stood us in very good stead one has many uh, friends and well wishers you know people always know that our heart is in the right place sometimes our minds are not you mm. know so you know we get things wrong make some mistakes in business but they always know that we the quintessential driving force behind fotados is to you know favorably impact the young kids who want to learn music and whom we are providing a service to are there more stores like the dhobi talab one where people meet and so just we have play? what is called the friday jam uh-huh. it happens in all fotado stores okay sadly not as well patronized today mm-hmm. as used to be in the past because mm-hmm. nowadays kids are also not so keen on traveling to a place to jam and play and all of that they doing it in their small things mm-hmm. i don't know whether many kids are also now doing a lot of jamming because mm. of so many other gadgets and devices and all that they are this thing but we do have it and we will allow anybody and everybody to play wherever so you'll see our piano showrooms people who can't afford a piano coming and practicing there Without especially any- b- right before trinity exams Yeah so for yeah. Trinity exams we make pianos available for people to practice so we are yeah. one of the few places in the world I am told mm-hmm. that enable because it's an yeah. alien instrument and the students want to practice on it we charge a small fee now uh-huh. because we can't all the time do it in our stores so mm-hmm. we have to hire premises we have to cover those costs mm-hmm. yeah and um, we are in, provide people the opportunity to practice but uh, if we had enough in where we'd have practice rooms and we'd have mm. opportunity because it's sometimes not easy to for people to buy instruments of very good quality that they need the, the, i think the biggest uh, shortcoming uh, biggest challenge is space uh, all exams sure. are always um, on the baby grand and at the most we have a weighted keys digital piano that's right even for uh, many upright. houses even a digital piano is yeah. a challenge to accommodate in there in mumbai yeah. in in our metros especially because you know Mm-hmm. The one thing that India rivals the Western is cost of property mm. because we're a large population. So yeah. that is a challenge. It's yeah. true. So that's why people, in fact, l- do a lot of piano learning on a keyboard, yeah. which is not the right thing to do. You, know, yeah. you learn bad habits, etc. But that's what I mean. I try and tell a lot of my customers that, but they still make this decision due to yeah. genuine considerations, yeah, compulsions. That's right. uh you handle a lot of responsibility um you juggle multiple roles how do you go about doing that of late i have been able to delegate so we mm-hmm. have, as i mentioned we have very good professional mm-hmm. setup in place in every i mean everything so 
my role now is more strategic than anything else. I do get my hands dirty quite a bit because uh, uh, we also want to ensure that standards are maintained. I've been doing this from the day after I finished school. So mm. I have a lot of experience. And I do want to share that. But uh, I think delegation and acceptance of delegating, mm. you know, which took me some time to come to terms with, has really helped me to uh, to multitask and do a lot of things. We now, I'm, I forgot to mention, we have another... Uh, interesting project which is now 10 years old actually mm -hmm. the Conbrio Festival which is a festival uh, started off as a piano festival in memory mm -hmm. of my dad of our dad mm -hmm. uh, now in its 13th year in fact happening on the 15th, 16th and 17th of uh, September at the NCPA mm -hmm. uh, this year it's a piano violin and voice competition uh, oh. We have, and plus a full festival over three days with musicians from all around the country coming and performing and all of that. Uh, that's uh, presented by the Futaro's Conbrio Foundation. Mm -hmm. So we have our foundation as well, which is trying to do, you know, um, work to help the, reach the music message. Mm -hmm. uh, some, quite a lot to the, you know, um, I mean, outreach programs outreach and, programs, yeah. uh, you know, students and kids who can't learn music, plus mm -hmm. at this high level competitions, etc. So I'm, I'm more involved in, you know, in that sort of work now, especially mm -hmm. Conbrio, which is like my baby, mm -hmm. you know, and quite passionate about it. And we have some very good leadership there, uh, you know, festival directors who young people who are great ideas mm -hmm. i would strongly recommend you come for it yeah yeah this this year's festival actually is uh, called uh, uh, pictures at a concert mm -hmm. uh, emanating out of the pictures at an exhibition of musokski mm -hmm. uh, where every piece being presented the performer is going to present a visual artwork either a painting or a drawing or something that r correlates to Mm. is or her interpretation of the piece. Mm. So that, as we say, the next time you look at a painting, you'll imagine what it sounds like, sort mm -hmm. of impact that we are trying to achieve. So a lot of out-of-the-box uh, uh, stimulating, educative, come competitive environment that we're trying to create out of this. So to some extent, my energies are now uh, channelized towards that and less towards the other stuff because we have a very good setup in place there. Mm. So, uh, what what values and principles uh, do you think are guiding you in your professional life? I think the the foundation of any and everything, which I think we also try to espouse, is that of trust. Hmm. So it's about transparency, you know, uh, thereby being honest and sincere about everything. And I, uh, it's the financial. Consideration is very important mm. in a business. That's what ensures you can continue to do the work you do. But mm. it has never been of the utmost priority. Mm. Uh, I'm sad to say our the tax man and our chartered accountants will testify to that. <laughs> but, um, you know, but uh, I think uh, uh, relationships and trust, mm. I think that's the, that's the one mantra that I like to share with people who join Futado's our staff mm. and all, I, I invo I'm involved in their uh, induction and orientation. And all. This uh, crucial element mm. that mm, if you have trust in any relationship, personal, family, spousal, whatever, mm -hmm. if that's the underlying bedrock of it all, then everything else falls into place, you know. So complete transparency. Mm. I won't sell you an instrument that's defective, even mm. if you're ready to buy it, mm. you know. I, we do a lot of trade-ins mm. and sell uh, used pianos. I could easily sell them as brand new. Our competitors mm. do. Uh, we don't. Mm -hmm. We'll tell you they're so many years old. We made this much money on it, so you only pay us this much. I think that stands us in very good stead. Mm. You know, so I, that's. It's not a conscious thing. I think that's how we've been brought up. But that's the ethos. Very much the ethos at Fortados. And mm. God help you if you don't adhere to it. Yeah. <laughs> and in your uh, in your active years, um, how have you seen the music industry evolve? So I'm no longer active, you mean? No, no. <laughs> I, I mean, like, maybe you don't remember much from your childhood. Like yeah. Oh, you digit mean from years. when I this thing? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, 
the challenge has been to bring about professionalism in it. Mm. You see, because there's still mainly mom and pop stores. Mm -hmm. So, in not just musical instrument retail, in it, but in a lot of aspects, you know, even in yeah. professional music and all of that, mm. they're all homegrown affairs, mm. and therefore the professionalism is a bit of a, where you enter into agreements and contracts, adhere to them, mm. set certain standards, principles, whatever. That mm. has been the big challenge. And there has been a gradual evolution, mm. but sadly not as much as it should be. Not know. at the rate as okay, it yeah. should be. And not as much, mm. you know. So there's still a long way to go for that. The only way this... So it, it's both supply and demand. You know, demand mm. is growing at a frenetic pace. Mm. But supply will not be able to keep up if we do not professionalize you know and then then what do you do then you have a mm. major disconnect and a problem yeah so that's the that's the major challenge it's still about personalities which mm. it should not be it should be about you mm. know the industry as a whole and uh, the music yeah because music is the industry mm. but you know yeah. when people want to buy a musical instrument when it's still about uh, you know uh, calling up somebody you know and trying to leverage that and that sort of yeah. thing. And it's about doing business and uh, managing mm. principles from overseas and all of that. Mm. Very uh, unstructured and unprofessional as yet. Mm. It is changing. Uh, how has your mom been involved uh, throughout the business and your personal development? It's a good question. Yeah. Because she's been involved in a very big way. Mm -hmm. Not in the business. My dad always called her the spending partner. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> my mom's not originally not Indian. She's now a naturalized Indian. Very mm -hmm. proud of her Indian citizenship. She's Lebanese. Mm. I'm half Arab. Explains my good looks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so our our uh, our values and our so my dad was uh, came from very humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. His father was a butler. Uh, my dad lived in, uh, you know, the uh, quarters for the domestic help in the Wadia household mm -hmm. at Napinsi Road and all, and grew up entirely, or, I mean, made a success of his life entirely on his own hard work and initiative. Mm -hmm. But that meant that he spent most of his time at work. Right. So we were at home and mm -hmm. my mom really brought us up. Of course, dad was very mm -hmm. involved in many things, but uh, not in, uh, you know, the nitty gritty of it all. And our value system we owe to my mom. Yeah, she's played a very, very important role, not just for the family, but in the group, because we've tried to espouse and communicate that same value system elsewhere. All four of us, without uh, exception, we're very united. Yeah, so that unity and that, uh, I mean, we have a lot of disagreements and, uh, you know, bloodbath and fights and all of that. <laughs> but finally, on a, we agree to something on mm. a majority basis, mm. and that's it, and we'll then all adhere to it. It's always grounded in principles. 